Welcome to And That's the Game podcast. Presented by Pro Batter Sports. And That's the Game is hosted by Wayne Mazzoni. Today's special guest is Chris Solano. Hello and welcome to this episode of And That's the Game podcast presented by Pro Batter Sports. I'm your host, Wayne Mazzoni. This podcast is intended for baseball players at all levels, coaches of baseball at all levels that are looking to improve and educate themselves on the sport of baseball. Um, my background is as a 30-year college baseball coach currently a recruiting advisor for high school baseball players. On this episode, we have Chris Solano, who's the head baseball coach at University of New Haven. Chris has been there 12 years at New Haven, previously was a coach at Dowling College. And on this episode, we cover a lot of stuff about uh, college baseball, of course. Also, Chris's background of going from playing in college to playing overseas in Italy, his career path as a college coach. And then we also cover a lot of his interests off the field. He's a very passionate guy about music and poker, and we talk about that as well. So hope you enjoy this episode of And That's the Game podcast with head baseball coach from University of New Haven, Chris Solano. Um the reason I truly love doing these podcasts, and I know you host the podcast, and for the same reasons that I like it, it's probably why you like it, is you get to hang out with good people. But what I really enjoy is <clears throat> I know a lot about you, but I don't know everything about you. And the stuff that I want to start off with, start off with is kind of the early you, like what yeah. was the middle school, high school Chris Solano like, really from a, from an athletic standpoint. I think I know, I mean, you grew up in Ward Melville. Yeah, I was a Long Island guy. Um, I'm thankful that during those years, there were no such thing as camera phones for a lot of the time. Um, well, I grew up on the island. Um, growing up, played everything, really. Basketball, football, baseball. Um, was naturally always drawn to baseball. My father um, was really instrumental in, in teaching me the game and um, I was lucky enough to grow up with a baseball field behind my house. There was an elementary school behind my house and we had full access to it 24 seven, literally no one else used it. Um, so you talk about being lucky. I had my own pitcher's mound. I had an actual field to work on. Um, he was working on things without me knowing it. Um, right. you know, we, we did a lot of BP, a lot of batting practice together. Uh, he would catch me all the time from the mound. Um, and I think he was a little ahead of his time because he would force me to go into the outfield. Um, I remember this vividly and just hit me fly ball after fly ball. And I never played the outfield. And the, the, the thing about it to him was, I just want you to throw the ball far. So I want you to catch these balls from the outfield and throw them back into the plate area. Um, and essentially what that was, it was long toss. At the right. End of the day. right. Um, probably why my arm strength was so good. Um, Cause I just trained it early. Um, so that was um, that was my early days of baseball. Um, coached me in Little League for a short time. Then when I was 11 or 12, did the best possible thing and let me go on my own and had somebody else coach me. Um, and grew up playing Three Village Little League in, in Stony Brook, New York. Went from there to high school, obviously. High school played football and baseball. Um, enjoyed football tremendously and obviously baseball. Went on to play in college, um, and I think... Let me, let me interrupt you for a second, because <clears throat> I want to get to that shooting <clears throat> in a minute. Ward Melville is famous on the island for being the lacrosse town. So, Definitely not baseball. Right. So back in high school, was there a conflict with the lacrosse people? Were you, did you ever consider playing that? Like, how did, no. how did that influence any growing up for you, that they're such a lacrosse town? I, I'll tell you the truth. I don't... I don't see it as a conflict, but we were we were the center of the universe in terms of high school across. Um, we were the first district to really have world class high school athletic lacrosse. Being on the Ward Melville High School roster as a lacrosse player in my high school years guaranteed you a scholarship. You didn't right. even have to play. That's how far ahead we were, right? What it did though was it took a lot of potential baseball players away. A lot of guys I played little league with 
ended up going over to lacrosse and they were really good in little league and, and they probably would have been good in high school baseball, um, potentially college, who knows, but right. it took a lot of the talent pool. Um, and understandably so. Um, I think that we probably would have succeeded um, a little bit better for sure with more of those athletes staying in baseball. Um, currently, I think the baseball program at Ward Melville High School, um, Coach Petrucci, Lou Petrucci is doing a fantastic job. Yeah. Um, and he has kept a lot of guys in the sport. Um, and, and, and they've actually won an awful lot of games in the last 10 years or so. So um, the pendulum kind of shifted back to the middle, yeah. if you could say. I think around that, everybody else caught up lacrosse-wise. Um, we, were just, we were the first – you know what it was, Wayne? It, it, it lends itself to baseball. We had the first lacrosse youth league. Right. So we had guys playing that sport from knee high and all the way up through high school. So um, the development was just so far ahead. Um now, I would assume some of those guys probably were on the football team with you, too? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And so you played football all through high school? Uh, 10th grade through 12th, yes. 10th grade, okay. And do you have, like, do you feel like in, in whether it's coaching now or your playing days, did, did you get something out of football that helped you in baseball? Um, I got a – an awakening in 10th grade when I, when I first played um, <laughs> about August practice and the two a days um, and the conditioning parts and just an absolute grind um, that didn't exist in the baseball world. Right. Just it's a different animal. We all know that um, there's something about being physical that makes the sport to me so much more of a connection with teammates, with, um, you know, everyone involved because of the physicality, I think. Um, and listen, my best friends were on the team, right? So it was kind of, we were all in that, 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 that tough situation together. Um, and it really opened up my eyes. I, I had no idea how to play football when I got there, other than what I saw on TV and what I messed around and did playing in my backyard or in street football. Yeah. Once I started to figure out what football really was, um, you know, it really became something I wanted to be as good as possible at. I loved game day. I loved just like the nervous energy uh, right before kickoff. You know, you're essentially in a fight that's okay with someone right. across the line of scrimmage. <laughs> and in high school, you have all those, you know, that that testosterone and all those things. Um, yeah, and, and I was I was wild. I had hair down to the middle of my back. I had the war paint. Um, and I loved everything about it. Um, and I actually ended up having a, a pretty successful high school career for someone who didn't play till 10th grade and 12th grade. I played in, um, I played in the long Island all-star game. Um, wow. Yeah. So I was actually lucky and I wasn't good. Let's don't, don't get me wrong. It was just, um, I was good enough to do that. So, um, that made me proud to be able to excel from not playing till 10th grade to, to doing that in 12th grade. So, um, baseball, However, it was clearly always for me, no matter what, the number one. I would play fall baseball in high school on Sunday wow. after I played uh, football Saturday games. Um, it was a little tough moving around, but yep. it was what it was. And did you know, like when in high school, did you always know you wanted to play baseball in college? Yeah. Did, and tell me about that process to go to get recruited or how did it work to get you? Because you went to New Paltz, correct? Correct. Yeah. So, so how did that come about? Well, the funny part was you, I was a, I was a late bloomer late. Um, and we're talking 92, 93 of the recruiting process. Right. So 1992, 1993 is miles away from where recruiting is now. Completely right? different. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you committed back in those days, basically almost your spring of, of senior year let alone maybe the, the fall um, of your senior year. Right. Um, and again, I wasn't um, – physically, I wasn't there yet. I mean, I was a left-handed pitcher that could throw strikes, and um, I, I had um, a good idea of what to do on the mound, but I didn't have velocity yet. Um, so I wasn't that attractive to – I had some Division two offers. Um, I had, um, you know, the, the run-of-the-mill – kind of hodgepodge of offers. I had some division ones that were, that did speak to me, but again, it wasn't like today. You didn't get the, you know, it's a phone call. Your phone's ringing every night in your house. Um, you're getting a letter in the mail. Right. Um, and there wasn't as much contact as there is now. It just wasn't the way it was. No. 
and we didn't I didn't play on a a, a high end AAU team because there really wasn't that. Right. You played your local leagues. Um, so how it really unfolded was I just I, I wanted to go to a place that I, I wanted to go for almost other reasons, too. Um, if you know anything about New Paul's, it's very um, it's a very artsy, quote unquote, town. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of music there. There's a lot of um, it's a lot of art things going on there. And, and music is something that really appeals to me and, and still does in my life. So I think it kind of drew me there. But my passion to play never, never stopped. Um, so it's kind of an eclectic mix. I was the guy that would go see, you know, the obscure heavy metal band and then go to baseball practice four hours later um, the next morning. Um, and it just, you know, I'm pr pretty much still that guy. Actually, <laughs> We don't change much in our lives. We really no. don't. Um, how, how did your career go from on the field baseball wise? Did you, you know, I don't know back then who was the coach. Did you have the same coach? Like what was the, what was your baseball experience like there? It was, it, it centered around the friends that I still have, um, on my teammates. We had a coaching change. Um, and I, I, being, being a coach now for a living, I don't, I don't talk negatively about anybody that ever coached me because it's just such a complicated and difficult job, right. um, especially at the college level. Um, so really centered around the friends I still have, you know, like many guys, I still have a group thread with all my college buddies. We still, it's still active. We see each other when we can. Um, so really centered around that. Um, my success level was pretty good. It was, you know, fair up, down in the middle. Um, I didn't dominate. I wasn't all American, um, but I competed well. Um, and as I went, um, I felt like every year I got better and better. Um, and what that was, I don't know. I don't know if it was just me getting my, my delivery was always good. My mechanics were always sound. I always threw strikes. Um, I two weighed in college too. Um, and I just started to improve and improve and improve. Um, got myself in the best possible shape I could. And um, it ended up giving me an opportunity to, to even play after college, which, you know, I, I always dreamt that and everybody does. Um, and, and, and I got to do it. So um, I guess that all that hard work, you know, did pay off. I definitely coupled that hard work with a lot of um, fun and good times, you <laughs> know, as we, yep. as we all do. Yep. Um, and again, no camera phone. So let's be thankful. <laughs> um, but yeah, and that's kind of how the college thing unfolded, um, you know, and then I ended up and I don't want to jump too far ahead. And then I end up uh, I wake up and I'm in Europe. <laughs> So I'm about to get, that's the second part of it. I guess I'll ask you this first. Did you know as a college baseball player that you'd coach someday or did that materialize that career path later? I knew that I wanted to be involved in the game. I knew I wanted to play till I possibly couldn't play anymore. And then I thought coaching would be something that would stay, you know, in my life. I thought, uh, out on the outset, I thought I'd be a gym teacher, probably, maybe, and then coach high school baseball. Um, and then that shifted to kind of, well, maybe there's a way to do this full time. And that shifted to college. Um, but if you would have asked the 21 year old me, um, would I be going into my 19th year of a head coach in college? I would have said probably not. Got it. Right. OK, so let's go back to the Europe thing. So. How did that experience come about? Tell us about that, because I've definitely not had anyone on as a guest that did that route at all, which I'm fascinated with. So at the time I grabbed, like the time of my senior year, um, I, I, I had gotten some some interest. Um, I'd say light interest from organizations. You know, we, we may give you a chance. We may do this. We may do that in terms of signing as a free agent, whatever. Didn't didn't pan out. And um, I got a call basically from um, a, a manager in Italy. And they said, we know that, you know, we know that the Seattle Mariners had talked to you and spoken to you and had some interest. It didn't work out, but we know that you're also a hundred percent Italian. We can trace your lineage. If you want to come over here and play in our professional league and um, experience that, you know, we were interested in, in giving you a contract. So the first thing I said was this, this, 
there's got to be a catch. Like, you, I'm a, do I, am I going to end up in the military? <laughs> like, am I going to, you know, you, you just don't know. Right, um, right. And I did some research and, and what I found out actually that there were currently, the, the season had started. So I found out that there were other Americans on the team um, from every level, guys that had played in the big leagues all the way down to single A, double A, triple A. There were five other Americans that were playing as natives like I eventually would. And then we had two other spots that could, the league allowed two other spots you could be from anywhere. So we had right. seven American guys on the team. Um, and I got on a plane, not knowing what was gonna happen when I got off. Um, guy met me, threw me in a, a Fiat, the size of my kitchen table. Uh, we drove to the stadium 700 miles an hour because there's no traffic uh, laws. And that was day one of what was probably the best experience of my entire life. So let's talk on the field first. Yeah. What? How would you describe the level of, of play in that league? It was actually much better than I anticipated. Again, with the players that were afforded each organization to have, you had a lot of pro experience guys there, um, as well as some of the native guys that were um, drafted by MLB teams. Their careers were done in the U.S. and they just went back home. So right. you, you had um, and, and talking to some guys that were veteran guys. And I agreed it probably equated to to high A to sometimes double A. Um, right. Depending on who's on the mound, depending on, you know, I pitched against a guy that was uh, started opposite Nolan Ryan in his final no hitter. Wow. Um, you know, he pitched for the Toronto Blue Jays at the time. So you had a really good and a huge international crop of guys there, too, um, that really did make it ultra competitive. Was anyone making decent money like were these guys trying to get back to affiliate it or were they going, listen, I can make a little bit of money doing it or. I think that there, yeah, there. Well, at that time, the American dollar was doing really well compared to what was the lira, which is right. now the euro, right? Yeah. So yes. we were actually getting paid, pay and a half. So if, it, for instance, if they were paying me in in dollars, my American dollars, our contracts were in American dollars, but they were worth almost two dollars in in lira. Right. So right. we were all doing well. Um, I didn't save a penny. <laughs> um, and uh, enjoyed every second of it. Um, we were given a great house, cars. Um, you know, the town took care of us. Um, they knew who we were. A lot. I didn't stick out because I I can look you know blend in with the Italian. But yeah. there was a couple guys from California, and they look like aliens. <laughs> right? Like they, so everyone knew who we were. Yeah. Um, so and it, we had success, and it was great. Um, but the reality is, most guys were there getting paid. Number one, these organizations want to win. And that's the other thing I found out quick. They send you home. If you don't do it, and it's not like they have to pay for the season, you go home right away. Like I saw guys come for two weeks and they got released and sent home. Right. Um, so it was more of a, you got to put up um, and, and compete. And um, yeah, it was it was a very um, good, for, for a 23 year old, you know, single guy. Yeah, I couldn't ask for more, but most guys were looking to extend their careers and just, do this as a great experience, get some money. Um, we did have one guy play, go back, and then make it all the way back to the big leagues. Wow. More team. Wow. Yeah. wow. How long did you wind up, you know, staying in terms of time? Like, was it under a year, over a year? How long did it wind up being that you were there playing? Just at that mark. Just at the year mark. Just at the year mark. Okay. Yep. Um, have you been back to Italy since? No, and it's one of my regrets. Um, you know, life gets in the way, as they always say. And now here's the good part. I can still go there and I can, I know enough Italian. I still know how to get around. I can get around on mass transit. So my wife and I are going to go. I'm going to wait till my son gets a little older. Um, yeah. And then we'll, we'll we'll make it back over there. But I, I know how to, um, obviously, I know how to get around. I know how to, to live there. So yes. I think, and I know where to go. I've seen the entire country. So That's I think awesome. it would be... I'm, I'd be a really good tour guide um, if anyone's looking to hire one. Um, but yeah, we're gonna we're gonna eventually make it back there. My wife's never been, so I think it'd be great for for her. A thousand percent, yes, no question. Now, so that comes to an end, you're, right? Obviously, you're realizing. I guess at that point, I'm not. Pl you know, playing is not the route. Did you immediately get into college coaching? What was the What was the first path after the playing was over? Well, actually, when I got home. Um, I pitched really well there. And then I got, I signed with um, 
the Sioux Falls Canaries in the Northern ah, League. I didn't know that. Which is in the same, you know, division as St. Paul Saints. And um, probably at the time, the, one of the highest, if not the highest, independent league. Right. Um, so I did that for a season. Um, but it was really one of those writing on the wall moments. I, I looked around for that season and said to myself, could I continue this? Probably. But the reality is they're going to tell me to stop at some point. And where am I going? Right. So it was kind of like, let's try to. So I enjoyed that, did that. Um, and then I, I, I ended up just looking for any graduate assistant position I could find. Found one on Long Island at Dowling College. Um, and to make that one a quick story, went there as an unpaid, no classes, straight volunteer, actually. Bartended, uh, bounced, did what I had to do to, to support myself as best I could. Um, parlayed that into eventually, maybe four years later, the head coaching spot there. Um, got really fortunate. Became a head coach at 27. Um, and here I am at 47. So... Now back to that. So you spent how many years did you spend at, at Dowling as an assistant? Four. So basically all that time, did it ever become a decent paying job or were you constantly just hustling, doing a million things on the side like young coaches do? There was not one day where it was well paying. Um, right. But I think that's part of the process. So I think it, what it allowed me to do actually is do some other things in, in the game. I worked um, up here in Connecticut over the summers as um, as the pitching head pitching instructor at the Little League of America complex in um, in Connecticut, yeah. um, where they had the Connecticut Regional. Yes, was that uh, Bristol? Bristol, yeah. Bristol, yeah. Ended up doing that for two summers, um, and honestly, it really was. You didn't make the money, but it was such a good experience and such a good time. Um, you know, it's like when a band makes it big and they talk about how they had to play in bars that. 10 people were there and they, they really grinded it out. You really do appreciate the other side of it when you get a full-time job and when you, you can make it a career. I think that's what makes me appreciate this so much is going through, through things like that. So, and then obviously I remember, you know, when you came, became the head coach at Dowling and, and you had great success with that program. Was it at the beginning of becoming the head coach at a pretty young age, did you do you look back on it and go, yeah, I kind of had it figured out, or did, were you figuring all of it out as you were going? Well, I took the head coaching job, and I remember thinking I have this figured out, and then realizing I knew zero. <laughs> um, was I was I lucky enough to be surrounded with good players, and um, you know, I knew enough. I knew enough to basically win baseball games. But what I was really needed to work on was what does it mean to be a head baseball coach, right? What does it mean to um, have relationships with your coaching staffs, with your players, with your administration, all the things you don't do until you become a head coach, right? So as the assistant, and you know this, you're the guy that the guys come to a lot of times um, when they can't go with the head coach. You're the guy they look to as, you know, the, the almost the older brother rather than the coach once that role changes, I think you really, the dynamics change. Um, I had to figure out really how to balance the insecurity of being so young with doing the job. And I think I probably was, for lack of a better term, a complete psychopath my first couple of years because A, I felt like I had something to prove. Like I got this job, I'm 27. The program had success with me as right. an assistant. So then I had to now continue that. I'm 27. I know there's people going, what in the world is going on here? How'd they hire that guy? You know, all those things. Now it also worked as motivation. Um, and the blessing and the curse was my first year, we won a conference championship. Um, so it's really hard to start th reflecting about, hey, I'm not doing this the right way when you right. win. Um, my administration at the time was brand new. So I got the job. My AD then left and a brand new admin came in, whole new administration. Right. Um, and it was a rough road in terms of their expectations, my idea of what the job was, but they mentored me um, enough and, and very well to get to the point where start to figure out what was important. Um, 
and how more than just winning can be important. And really, what do you want to be? Who do you want to be? And what do you want your program to be? Um, right. We had a tremendous amount of success. Um, and it was um, it was one of the best experiences I had my six years there. And again, I was doing this at a very young age, but I never really stopped and said, wow, you know, you're you're really younger than everyone and you're doing this. To me, it was just, I'm going to do this and I'm going to figure out how to succeed. So now, um, obviously you were there and, and you were successful. So this is like going back into my memory of things, trying to put the timeline together. I do remember thinking really before I knew you well, when you got the New Haven job, I do remember thinking, well, why the heck did he leave Dowling? Because he was doing really well there. Not a lot. So I, so yeah so i guess the question is when as most people watching this will know dowling is no longer a college right Correct. how long start with that how long after you left did they basically close their doors i was probably three years three years after i was gone okay um, did that have anything did you see anything coming or do you just said you know what um so i guess i'll just ask the question what what transpired to get you from a successful program that you were at to, to New Haven? A couple of things. Number one, I did see some cracks in the foundation there. Um, did I think any place would ever close? Like in those days, a college closing was, you know, unfortunately now there are a lot. But right. then that was never, a, never even a possibility. But I knew enough to know that we weren't heading in the, the right direction or a good direction yeah. financially. Um New Haven always had that Northeast Division II reputation of being probably the best Division II Northeast traditional baseball school. Um, you know, Coach Vieira, from the time he created the program till till the time he left, that was that was the D two school. Yes. Um, you know, in terms of history, right? So, um, what else appealed to me? Well, the conference. Um, getting into the NE ten um, was always something I wanted to do. Um, so every year. I was I wasn't our our institution wasn't in the NE10, so every year I'd get to a regional against mostly other NE10 schools. Um, we'd have success, but it was always like, yeah, well, you're in the other conference, so right, right. You know, um, I don't know. We should have took we should have took the other NE10 school instead of you into the tournament, and so kind of so in 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 um, so a bit of irony, really quickly, I come to New Haven. And they were like, well, I'm hearing from coaches at the time. Well, you know, you're in the NE10 now. This is war. This is a different thing. Your conference wasn't as good. And I won the conference tournament my second year. Um, so it was kind of like, you know, it would all that motivation, right? But really what drew me, um, other than the resources, um, the salary was significantly higher. I had a full-time assistant built in, which at our level is very unique. Right. Um, still, still. Um and everything on campus and everything I saw was a football school with a football program. Um, and at the time, it would just made complete sense to me. And I, I wasn't I wasn't married to staying on Long Island. I was I was OK with moving. Looking back, um, probably the best move I made. Right. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, I would agree it's an it's an upgrade in, in many ways. But then secretly, you must have been slightly relieved slash sad for Dowling to close its doors and there goes not only the program, there goes the university. So, yeah. and obviously the move was a, was a good one, but I just, that's where I was wondering is where that timeline was because it was a pretty shock on the outside that yeah. this, that this college would no longer exist. You know? Yeah. And then, like I said, it was three years in the making before it, it officially closed, but it was really tough seeing my friends that still work there go through those last three years. Then they officially close the doors and then they're scrambling. Um, most, if not all, ended up on their feet, which is great. But I also, in, there was a small percentage of me that said, I don't want to be in that position if I get an opportunity to, you know, to go somewhere else or do something else um, at another institution. So um, I took it. I probably just I jumped off the Titanic early, essentially. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, let's let's make that a good time for take a short pause and we'll be right back with Chris Solano. Introducing Pro Matter, the future of baseball training. With the PX3, you can practice like you play. There is a better way to train your athletes. With an easy to use touchscreen controller, you can program any pitch, any speed, at any location. The Pro Matter Simulator is designed to replicate real game, real world pitching. Better practice, better play. Hit any spot inside or outside the strike zone. 
the PX3 features reliable mechanics and an optional automatic ball feeder system. Get the most from practice. In addition to baseball, the PX3 is perfect for softball. With the PX3, no more relying on practice pitchers or basic pitching machines. Better practice, better play. Pro Batter. Train like it's game day. Step up to the plate with confidence. Hello, this is Wayne Mazzoni, host of And That's the Game podcast. I hope you're enjoying listening and watching the podcast as much as I am making it. It's really been enjoyable to connect with all these great people, great baseball people. Uh, the purpose of this message is to let you know about College Baseball Advisors, a company that I founded a couple years back after 30 years as a college baseball coach. I basically guide players and families through the recruiting process. If you're interested in learning more, please go to collegebaseballadvisor.com and learn more or book a call where we basically will meet and talk about your recruiting process. I'll lay out a three-step plan for you to move forward. If after that call, you think I'm someone that can help you in this process, we can discuss that. If not, you just want to take that information and use it to go forward. That's great as well. So hope to see you down the road. Thank you. So we left off, we were talking about leaving Dowling a place, which was really your only coaching experience, right? Ultimately, you were there how long? 10 years? Years. Yes. Okay. Oh, six total. Six total. Six total. No, sorry. I'm sorry. Six as a head coach. Right. And then four as an assistant. So it was yeah. basically about yeah, 10 years. Yeah. And then you come to New Haven. What was the, what year did you get the New Haven position? Spring of 13 was my first uh, season. Okay. So how, you know, how has the experience been? I believe it's a long, you know, it's 12 years we're encapsulating, but how has that move been in terms of, you know, comparing that position and that role at New Haven compared to Dowling? Is it the same gig? Or has the, the sport evolved? Is it just different at New Haven? How would you just describe doing, in essence, the same job, but at a new place? Uh, new Haven had a bigger um, campus, had a bigger enrollment, also had um, a bigger athletic department. Um, again, when you're dealing with football, um, everything gets bigger. Um, and that was one of the things that intrigued me. Um, I would say that the biggest difference was joining a different conference, a much better, more competitive conference. Um, and, you know, all the challenges that come with any new experience basically in my mind stem from just not being used to where you are. So w when I went through it in the beginning, it was more of, I can sit here and let's just ponder everything that's different and every, all these obstacles, or let me just put my head down and just charge through this. I'm, I'm essentially, you know, taking over for a legend in a way yes. of coach V. Um, I, I was getting hit from all angles. Um, you know, I was the Italian guy from Long Island, so everyone was had those preconceived notions. They're probably right. <laughs> but um, at the end of the day, I really, I got to be honest with you, the challenge of it, um, because we had obstacles, um, like we all do. We had obstacles to being the top of our conference right. at New Haven. We did, um, and still do, for that matter, in, in some areas. But I think the challenge of that. You know, it, it was my Bill Parcells, I think, a little bit where I was like, OK, like I could I could make a regional every year at Dallas. Like we are we're positioned. We're doing the machine is just going. Yeah. Uh, it was one year removed from us going to the Division two World Series. So it was kind of like I can I can continue this. But then I saw this challenge in the better conference um, chance to move and experience something new. So just jumped at it. And um, but the main difference was just just in terms of resources and in terms of the size was the big difference. So you have one thing you've always had a good perspective with is obviously you love your job. This is your career. This is your passion. But I also love you also realize or you don't take yourself incredibly crazy seriously. And I also think you've said as everyone who's worked in the Northeast in baseball, we also realize we're not a power program in football and basketball. It's just not going to be that way, certainly maybe at certain parts of the country. So you've always had a good perspective with, you know, kind of your your career. What would you say, what, what what's the best parts of doing what you do? And what are parts that if you did something else, you wouldn't miss? Well, I, I could say you're absolutely right. Um, I don't take myself very seriously at all. 
<laughs> um, but what I mean by that is, and this is an important distinction, I take my job very seriously. I take being the head coach at New Haven very seriously. I don't take myself that serious. It's not about me. It never has been um, for me. Um, and I think that um, the one thing I will tell you that really makes the difference for me doing this job over really anything else is the relationships that you make with your players and your assistant coaches. It's just such a different dynamic than working in an office setting nine to five and having friends at work. Um, the players and the assistant coaches and your staff, it, the family atmosphere that, that we work really hard at keeping and creating, that's what drives me. Um, having, having, you know, 30 plus guys every year that have that special bond and having assistant coaches that, and you've been through it, where you're the ups, the downs, the 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 cycle of what is a really long season um, every year keeps me coming back. Like that's that's what I would withdraw from the most if I didn't do this. Um, right. That's you know I would start to twitch right around the end of August because fall ball is supposed to be starting. Um, getting on the planes for your first couple weekends to your spring trips, um, driving home and like you know, yelling at the steering wheel after you just, you know, lost the, uh, got walked off on right. um, th those things. Like having a job that I always said this, having a job that makes you absolutely miserable in a way based on the result is not always a bad thing because right. the passion is still there. I know a lot of people that drive back and forth to work every day and every day is exactly the same. And every day it's just, let me get to five o'clock. Um, our days don't end at five o'clock a lot of the times, and that's fine. But that passion, it can make me really miserable and really happy. And there's not too many jobs that can do that. Um, that's a great point. So I think that's what I love the most. And I'm okay with the misery sometimes because it makes me realize that it, it's worth it's worth putting the work in when things go well. There's no better feeling than winning and succeeding, watching our guys succeed. Um, so I would definitely miss that the most. What I wouldn't miss, um, I really don't know. I really don't know. I'm so conditioned, I think, at this point to the life cycle of a coach that I'm not sure. I don't know what a job where you automatically have your weekends off looks like. Right. I don't know what a job, luckily, that 5 o'clock comes and you're done. I don't know what that looks like. Um, maybe just being on all the time, I wouldn't miss because right. my phone is always on. I've got right. 33 players. I've got assistant coaches. I'm, and I never not answer the phone, the text, whatever it is. I always answer the phone. You know, so I think maybe that um, is what I would miss. I love the recruiting part. I love having kids on campus um, and visiting with parents. I, I, I like everything about it. Um, fundraising, it's not my favorite. I'm good at it. Um, but I think... Basically, maybe just being able to shut off for even more. There are times, and as you know, there are times where we can, but it doesn't last long, you know? So maybe that. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, you're right. That's not having been on a college program for the last two years after spending a lifetime doing it. Yeah, there, there's no other place you can get those relationships. No, no question. So that's the only thing I really miss. What I don't miss is you nailed it perfectly. Like now on a Saturday, I might go to brunch and not have much else to do. And that's, there's nice, but there's no perfect life, no matter what you got. But you, that's the thing you said. Yeah. Someone's someone needs coach Solano, coach Solano, better. he's going to yeah. be there to, to take care of their thing. All right. You touched on this briefly on it. Just, I kind of always cover this on every talk is what is either at your recruiting style, what makes you like somebody? What is it that will make you offer somebody? So I don't know how you want to answer that, but what's yeah, your sure. what's your view of the recruiting process and how you go about it? I think for us, um, it's I have a pretty good idea of what will work for us in terms of let's start with talent, you know, the baseline that we need um, in order to compete and, and bring in the type of talent that we need to. I'm also pretty aware of, the other um, aspects that'll work at our university. What I mean by that is, you know, geography, um, you know, everything else that goes into it. Um, I think that each university is un a unique place and a unique environment. I am pretty good at identifying what'll work in ours. Um, in terms of what we look for, it, it's it's a lot of the same things. Um, 
there are things that I don't really concentrate as much on um, that some might. To me, um, physical size isn't always a, a, a prerequisite for me um, at, at most positions. Um, I really do try to hone in on guys that want to play the game. And I don't mean want to play the game when it's time to practice and it's time to play games. I mean the guy that's going to be hitting in the cages when practice is over. Um, I mean the guy that's going to live it, breathe it, and do all those things. I think we're, we're doing a pretty good job of bringing those guys in. And once you get some of those guys, that filters down into everybody. You know, if, right. if a couple guys have it, then all of a sudden 30 guys will have it. Um, but the reality is I want guys that are going to compete. And I'm pretty confident in myself and my coaching staff to develop talent. But the things we can't develop are the things I look for. So right. that certain degree of natural ability, your character, you know, we look, I look for things that people probably won't even realize. I watch it. If I know I'm going there to see someone, I will try to find them in the parking lot and see how they get out of their car and see if mom and dad are holding their bags, see how they're interacting right. with their brothers and sisters, see how they're interacting with their parents. Um, all those things, all those things add up to me. Once you get past the talent part and you identify that, what'll, what will really, I recruit families. I don't just recruit players. I, re, I recruit the entire family um, because that's what's going to be around for four years. Uh, you know, and, and at the end of the day, with, with where recruiting has gone since I started, to where it is now, um, there are a lot. Of, I mean, we could do a whole episode on this, obviously. Of course, of course. But you, you really have to do your due diligence now, because, quite frankly, it can be a revolving door if, if, if it, if it, if it wants to be. It's so easy to transfer now. It's so easy to puddle jump from school to school. Um, so finding the right fit for me, character wise, player wise, um, family wise, is is really really important. Do you ever see somebody and just go, uh, this kid's too good, like I'm not going to get him here? Like we, almost everybody does, but you go somewhere and you see a junior throwing 93, yeah. you're calling him or you're going, he's going to BC or UConn, I'm not wasting time. Well, I think it's kind of a loaded question. We, we're we fortunate enough now, um, facility-wise, to kind of compete. Um, we've got some brand new buildings that were built that are – when I tell you top of the line, it's top of the line. Um, this and is I'll say favorite. I haven't seen them, but I've seen kids that you've recruited that either have committed to you or checked out the school and will say to me, it's unbelievable what they got up there. So I know yeah. it's fact. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'd like to think on our roster currently, we have guys that can easily play at the Division One level. I mean, I know we do. Um, oh, I know that. I know you guys are question, good. Yeah. Here's what I would do. I would try to find out if there's a hook for me. And what I mean by that is we have a really good engineering program, a really good criminal justice program. Are they interested in either of those? Because you don't get that everywhere. Right. Um, can I get them on campus? Because if I get them on campus and they sit down with me for a day and they meet our players and meet our staff and look at our facilities, do I have a chance? Now, what I also don't want to do, because you know this, time is so limited, you don't want to go chasing waterfalls. You don't want to get – you know, spending time on the guy you have absolutely no chance right. on. So what I would do, Wayne, to answer the question is, yeah, if I see someone like that, I'm going to talk to other people and rely on the guys I trust, whether it's their AAU coach, whether it's before I would just cold call and say, you know, we're interested. And then, you know, you put, you could put a kid in an awkward position where, you know, Hey coach, I'm really just looking to go to these five schools or I'm pursuing other opportunities. Right. Right. So to answer the question, will I go after him? Sure. How, to what degree really depends on the other information I could find. Now, conversely to that, I make my living on finding a lot of those diamonds in the rough. Um, and it's even easier nowadays because, you know, as you know, the recruiting process has sped up so much. You're getting a lot of early commits, and there are a lot of guys that didn't peak yet right. in ninth or 10th grade, and then they do, and a lot of schools have already moved on to another class. So I can then, you know, scoop in and I'm pretty confident that I can identify talent and I can project pretty well. Um, and that's where we, we get our most success, honestly. And in sort of the recent, I guess I'll say since COVID transfer portal, even the NIL stuff and, and now this new ruling with the 34 man roster and D1, like 
have 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 the new wave of what's going on in college baseball is that you feel helped your program hurt or neither i think it's a little bit of both i think on the negative at my level the temptation to leave if you have success is going to be there um i think you know the more rookie of the years in the any 10 that i have the more first team all region guys that i have the more pitchers whose velocity spikes after they get to me that i have they're going to get tempted. Um, now I'll say this: we've got, especially after last season, we were we were very young. We won a conference championship, and we could have had a number of guys go and play at much bigger, quote unquote, bigger institutions and programs. Nobody went in the transfer portal. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we really have to do a good job now of. You know, you can't fake it. You have to have guys in your program. You have to care about them. You have to treat them well. You have to provide a good experience, and you have to have a good relationship because now it's so easy to walk out the door if you don't. So you cannot get lazy in, in those areas at all, um, which I'm okay with. We should be doing that anyway. Um, but I think that's the negative. I think the negative is, yeah, every year I could potentially go somewhere else, um, especially if I have a good year. Um, I think the positives – there's going to be roster spots that get taken away from guys, unfortunately, once this new roster limit kicks in. And you're talking about six guys from each power five getting put off a roster. And that's always going to trickle down, down, down. Um, I also think that people may start looking at things differently. I think it might become, you know, the, the, the diehard, I want to be a Division One baseball player no matter what. And I'm, I'm starting to see it a little bit um, where – People's perceptions change um, because, quite frankly, right now, the NCAA has set this up where it's the Wild West. Yeah. You can come and go, and coaches and, and, and staffs, for that matter, can cut you at any time. And, um, you know, everyone everyone runs their program the, the way they want to, and I'm, I'm not trying to um, talk negatively about anyone. It's just reality. They're, the loyalty factor is going by the wayside at this point and it loses it loses its luster day after day now it gets weaker and weaker and i, I just i want to build a program and not a team and i think at the top it's become just a year-to-year -year team rather than right. a program. right um so i think the positive is if you're looking for that at our level you and in my program you're going to get that you're going to get we don't troll the portal we add pieces when we need to i don't recruit out of it um so you can have a four-year relationship with a coaching staff. You can have a four-year relationship with your teammates and have friends for life. That's very difficult to do if you play somewhere for one year or you play there for yeah. two years. Yeah. Um, so that aspect, I hope, you know, continues to grow in our program and, and stays as strong as it is. But that's the positive. I can provide that. I can provide yeah. the non-revolving door. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, when I'm advising kids and they say, well, you know, maybe I'll start here and then I'll go somewhere else. I say, well, that's easy to say, but hopefully you go to a program where you fall in love with everything so much, even if you're one of the best in the country, you don't want to leave. Who right. Wouldn't it be nice? Like, just like you said, I think that's a lost element a little bit where we're in it for relationships. Now, listen, maybe if a kid really has a chance to play after college and get drafted, it's a different story. But the reality yeah. is, you should want to be in a place where top to bottom, the group is, is likes each other and is happy and likes the coaches as opposed to just always trying to upgrade because the grass isn't always greener, you know, in that yeah. situation. I think it's very dangerous to go into a, a, a situation where you say, I'm going to commit to this university, but the idea is I'm going to be there for one year and then I'm going to get my shot because Listen, on, on Twitter, on all these social media platforms, everybody will post the success stories. What they're not going to post Absolutely. are the ones that didn't work out. And quite frankly, there's more that don't work out than do. Um, yep. And that's just reality. But yep. I think it's very, very dangerous to go into it thinking that way. Um, yes. If you outgrow a place talent-wise and you have real opportunity, those are different conversations. Right, um, right. Because that's just the reality of college sports now, right? Right. But if you go into it with that preconceived notion that I'm going to leave after two semesters, I just think you're setting yourself up for um, what may not be the right answer. Agreed. Yeah. And I'm sure if a kid came to you and, and did want to go for some other opportunity and he's done all the right things and, and be, you're probably the first guy to say, dude, I'll help you get there. Like, 100%. you know, yeah, exactly. 100%. Exactly. 100%. And, and, and 
for that matter, we've had guys to have their four years. They had the COVID extension and, and I helped them go to grad school somewhere else. I get it. Exactly. So. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, I think the, for most of the kids that I wind up working with in, in recruiting, they all almost come in saying, I'd like to play D1 to start with. Yep. Not all, but but then I find it's, if that's all they want to play, I don't decide, I won't work with them. Like if I, it's D1 or bust, yep. go somewhere else, right? If it's, I'd love to play at Division One to play at the highest level I could. But if you get feedback from those schools and they say you're not good enough, hopefully you'll want to play at a Division Two or Division Three school because you, you love baseball and you want to get an education. I think what most people don't realize, you know, because you're in this, most people don't realize how good of a baseball player you have to be to play at the University of New Haven, to how yeah. good you have to be to play at a Trinity or a Wesleyan. It's fair. The, the college baseball is as good as it has ever, ever been. Right. And it, it's not, if you say, well, I'd love to play at UConn, but if not, you know, I'll, I'll settle to play at Eastern Connecticut. Are you kidding? Eastern right. Connecticut's got plenty of guys that throw 90. Right. Yeah. And plenty of guys that run a six, seven and every level is is has a ton of good players, you know, yours included. I'm sure if you if you played 15 Division one programs in the Northeast, I'm sure you'd be 500 or slightly above. That's how good your program is. Right. I would, I would agree. I think I wish I wish the, the, the answer instead of I want to play Division one baseball, no matter what. I wish the thinking was I want. I want a top-notch experience. Right. Right. Because that to me makes it like you can come to New Haven and get a better experience in everywhere in terms of playing on the field, in terms of the competition, in terms of the travel, in terms of how we do things, in terms of facility, than a lot of division one programs. Right. Um, so it's the it's about the experience to me. Because when you look back, you're not gonna remember 20 years after you're done playing whether you played at a division one school you're going to remember the experience you had. Um, and I still stand by this. If you are good enough to go play professional baseball, they pay a lot of people to make sure they find you. Yes. And yes. I have, I have a guy in the big leagues right now. He pitches for the pirates. Um, so to me, I, I just think people need to start looking at the experience. Um, you really judge it by that. Um, but you know, I, I get all angles, right? Like I understand yeah. But the experience is what's going to make the difference, not the number in front of the word or after the word division. Um, yeah, yeah. There are division three institutions that will blow away division two and division one um, from an experience standpoint, from a facility standpoint. It's just it's just common knowledge if you do your research. Exactly right. Agreed. All right. Let's switch gears kind of towards the end here. You know, you are a big personality. You're fun. No. Uh, you're, you're awesome. So what are some of the things that float your boat off the field? You talked about music. No. So would you call music one of your not, you know, top one, two or three hobbies off the field? Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, always been. Always been. I was in bands in high school. And um, I, I think that it's really important for us in this profession to have those things um, in your life that you're passionate about off the field because you will burn yourself out completely yeah. on the field and in this job. It, it lends itself for you to be burnt out because there's always something you could be doing. Always, you're um, right. right? Yep. So um, I, I think it's really important to have those other interests. Um, I'm the guy that on a random Saturday night at 11 o'clock, I'm on YouTube watching you know, a Black Sabbath concert from 1984 right. on YouTube, right? <laughs> um, so I'm just really passionate about um, about music. We've we've had our discussions, obviously, about Dave Matthews Band. I know you're you're a, I call you an Uber fan. You're like Uber a buff fan. super fan um, with Dave Matthews, and and I really appreciate that because I'm the same way. So um, in the next four weeks, I have a Motley Crue show I'm going to, a Godsmack show I'm going to, <laughs> and I just went to see uh, Lamb of God uh, this past weekend. So. Um, you know, it's not for everyone, but it's for me. Yeah. Um, so music is definitely up there. Um, I'm an avid uh, poker player. Um, I've been playing for a long time. Um, and it's also just another one of those releases for me that I enjoy and I'm really passionate about and spend time on. Um, 
And then clearly when you have a wife and a seven year old, then, yeah. you know, that, that takes up a lot of that, a lot of that pie, so to speak. Um, but those are probably my top two off the field. I enjoy working out. Um, I'm a cold plunge sauna guy. I'm a nice. Yeah. Um, I think fitness in our industry is super important too, because it can level you out. You know, our, our, our jobs are filled with the stress and anxiety that comes along with it. And I think that's really a good way to, uh, to kind of quell that stuff. I think it's important to do. Um, and plus, you know, listen, we have a physically demanding job too. When you're on the field, you want to be able to be on the field. Um, so I, I do my best to, to obviously keep up with that. Um, but those are probably the three things, um, because you need it, you need it. Um, so we can dive into any of those three topics. No, I do. Well, uh, so I know for I'm obviously you're a music guy, but you your preference is just the hard stuff, correct? Yeah, I I, I grew up um, really quickly. Uh, my cousins who are older than me, um, I grew up. They were huge Kiss Army guys. They were Kiss fans and heavy metal fans. And from the age three or four, I kind of just stumbled upon that that genre. They had the posters all over their walls, and you know, I remember looking at the first Kiss Alive album. And these were albums then, and I oh, yeah. pick up and go, who is like, who are these people? <laughs> and then it just fascinated me, and then I actually started to enjoy the music itself and not the spectacle. Right. Um, and yeah, and it, it kind of took off from there, and it's still still really strong. Like I go to concerts by myself. Like there there aren't you know, and I I, I enjoy the experience. Right, um, right. Plus, I can't really find people to go to see what I want to see. <laughs> so no, that's number one. Like I'm going out to Washington State to the Gorge just for Labor Day weekend. I'm seeing three Dave Matthews shows. I'm going alone because right. my people who really do like Dave, they don't like him as much as I do, where they want to right. spend three days camping to see it. So yeah, going alone. Nothing wrong with that. That's awesome. No, and I think there's yeah. something liberating about it. I yeah, think it is. Yes. Right. Um, you're surrounded by people with a common interest, and it's correct. It, it makes the world seem like a good place for a little while. <laughs> you know, I think it's great. Yes. Let me ask you on the poker thing, because um, there's a, it, most people watching like poker is a big thing to, yeah. to follow, to play. How did you get into it in terms of at a level where you're studying it and, you know, really good at it? How did obviously that must have come about in some way? Yeah, well, being really good at it is a uh, <laughs> it's a week to week thing. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think. Uh, you know, it, it, not to get too graphic here, but it's it's kind of like sex. Everyone thinks they're a little bit better than they are. <laughs> um, I think um, I got I started playing pretty regularly, probably um, about 20, 21 years ago um, before actually right before the huge boom. Right. But it was actually before that. Um, it's just something I stayed with. Um, yeah, you know, it's one of those things you, you have to be careful with because there's money involved and you have to have a level head in terms of knowing limits and, and not letting it, you know, spill over into taking over lives and yeah, yeah. You know, getting yourself in a bad spot. Um, but yeah, 20 years plus later, um, I still play regularly. I still enjoy it. I just as much as I'll be watching a random heavy metal concert on YouTube, I'll be watching, you know, um, a hand history video or a training video or um, just learning more about the game. The game has changed so much like everything else over the past, you know, 20 years. And um, it's really interesting to me. It's the game that you're. You, you can be good at it, Wayne, but to master it is almost impossible. Right. And I think that's what drives so many people. It's trying to attain that thing that you can't. Like, it's so intricate. Um, I love the psychological warfare. Um, I love the competition. Um, you know, I think that's a big part. Um, and I love the escape, too. I mean, it gives me chunks of time that I'm not thinking, well, I'm always thinking about the baseball program at New Haven. But, um, it just gives me somewhere else to focus um, my energy. And, and again, I really enjoy it. Um, I don't claim to be anything more than, um, you know, a pretty competent player. Um, and, and that comes from experience. I'm so. just laughing. I'm thinking of you holding pocket aces going, you know, we really got to get another bucket of baseballs at New Haven. I really Listen, I can tell you story <laughs> after story of me being in a really big pot and, and looking down at my phone and going, oh, my God, that's a recruit. Uh you know, like, right, right. You know, or, or in the middle of a hand thinking just what you said, did I call BSN and order our ball? And, <laughs> right. You know, like I, it's, yeah, that, that, that happens. Right. And, um, you know, it's funny too, because the guys on my team now, 
you know, the, the res- it, it kind of even did a little bit more of a resurgence lately. Like the guys on my team play all the time. Like our players play and I hear them talking about it and I can't, I don't can't and won't get involved at all. But it's funny. Th- the cat's out of the bag. They know yes. I'm a serious player. Right. Um, so we'll talk like strategy sometimes. And um, as I tell people, don't, don't come to me for advice. Like I don't, I don't want to be responsible for that. Right. Um, but if to talk the game, yeah, hundred percent. I, I, I love it. And not to mention in, what is it? The last five years, the explosion in gambling, like yeah. it's everywhere. And so that's actually almost a, a, to me, a more pure form than just, you know, going on FanDuel and betting games all the time. You know, if, if you would have told me six years ago that you'd be able to punch up on your phone, a website where you can legally bet on any NFL game, um, who's going to score the first touchdown, all those things that are involved. I, I am I've clearly, obviously not involved in sports gambling at all. I, I would have called you crazy. And then yeah, sure enough, me too. it's, it. you know, the Cincinnati Reds have a sports book in their stadium. Wow. You know, it's, it's to the point where it's just part of it now. Right. Um, you know, I was just watching the Pete Rose documentary and it's funny how the gambling um, aspect of the sport has leaked firmly into the sport, but it's still the unwritten rule. It's the worst thing you can do as a baseball player. Right. Correct. Um, Correct. So I, I think there's a lot of, uh, there's going to have to be a lot of re-examining some of those old traditions, I think, as we evolve. Um, but I stay away from all that and uh, just narrow it down to to the card table. So, all right, my last last question for you then it may take you a minute to or a second to to come up with what you want to say. But I kind of, if you will, have a view that ultimately the people watching this what I want to affect is kind of that younger high school kid that wants to play college baseball. That's the goal. So I guess I'll ask you whether you'd say this back to the younger version of you or like, what would be one or two things of advice that you would give a freshman or a sophomore that loves baseball that would like to play as long as they possibly could? Well, my first thing would be don't pigeonhole yourself into this idea of a level or a school that you want to go to be open to literally everything. Okay. If, if you get to the point where schools are interested in you and your, your career progresses to that, be open to everything, go see everything, go explore everything because you have to chase the right fit. You can't chase what you perceive as the best level, what you perceive as, and I'm not just saying this because I'm a division two coach. I'm saying this because I've been in this business for a long time. At the end of your four year run, five year run, whatever it's going to be, your experience and, and, and the, the positive experience that you did or did not have is the only thing you're going to remember at the end of the day. So I think it's really important to be open minded about any level, any school, anywhere in the country until you really start paring things down right? um, and educate yourself and make that educated decision on where you want to go. That's kind of the end of your high school career. But if you're that ninth or 10th grader um, baseball player right now that wants to play at the next level, here's the one thing I'll tell you and has nothing to do with baseball. Make sure you are as academically sound as you can possibly be and get the best grades possible because two things, a, it's going to get you into the schools you want to go to B it's going to allow you to get scholarship money outside of athletic money that will make things more affordable. The last thing higher education is right now is affordable. It's not. Right. Right. And if your academic profile is strong, you, that equals real dollars. And you will be able to then make situations affordable just by doing the work starting in eighth, ninth, 10th grade, right? If you continue to stay sound, academically it's only going to help your cause financially and in terms of opportunity so i would say that for sure um and b it's easy to sit here and say just make sure you work hard right to me it's make sure you're working right make sure you're doing the things that are in fact going to make you better there's a lot of snake oil salesmen out there nowadays that will increase your velocity eight miles an hour, that will increase your bat speed 12 miles an hour, and we'll put it on the screen and you'll see it. That's great, but make sure you are doing things that can show up in a game on the field. Because when I go out to recruit, I don't go to a facility and watch someone throw on an iPad or watch someone take up bats in a cage. I watch them play baseball games. 
knowledge of the game, being able to perform on the field becomes the utmost importance. Yeah, well said. You're right. I mean, it's true. Many kids, and if we if we were their age, we would take advantage of some of those resources. Oh, yeah. There's nothing please, wrong with it, but yeah, please, you can't just be good I'm at throwing a play in any yeah, of that. Exactly. I'm just, yeah. you know, reinforcing what's really important, you know, to a college recruiter, let's say. Exactly. Because, you know, my job is to win baseball games. Not to have you in a facility and, and reach your highest possible velo on a running mm-hmm. or whatever. It, it's to beat our opponents, right? So I need to see you do that. I need to see you compete, um, which I think is becoming – it's almost a backseat now to increasing numbers and increasing percentages. The competition factor should always be number one, and and we're losing that. I think we're losing it a little bit. Yeah, I'm glad we ended on that because I, I couldn't agree anymore. There's got to be – both old school, new yes. school, but yep. competing ultimately when, when it's all said and done, the best competitors will, will play the game the best. Yeah. You know? And Wayne, believe me, we have, we have um, all the technology. We have it. We have synergy. We have all, we have it all, but we use it as a supplement, not as what drives, you know, what we're doing. The rap Soto isn't going to judge my, the pitchers. Right. Right. It, it's how right. they get out there and compete. Um, exactly. We, we use it, but we don't live by it basically. Yeah. That's perfectly said. All right, buddy. Chris, thank you so much. I always enjoy Pleasure. hanging out with you. And it's nice to get some locked in time. And uh, good luck to you in the fall and uh, with a couple of guys you got coming in that I happen to know and yep. will be you know, yep. following you in the spring. And anytime you and I can hang out would be awesome. Every Anytime you want. <laughs> you got it, buddy. All right. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this episode of And That's the Game podcast presented by Pro Batter Sports with today's guest, Chris Solano, head baseball coach at the University of New Haven. Pro Batter is a sponsor of this podcast. Pro Batter Sports, who you can research online, is a 20-year company that has made baseball and softball and now cricket training machines to help you perform better at your sport. They are state-of-the-art technology equipment, which helps you practice those sports like you play in the game as opposed to practice in a way which does not translate. So if you go to probattersports.com, you'll find information that has uh, covers all their machines, all their equipment that will help you in baseball, softball, and cricket. And we look forward to seeing you on the next episode of our podcast. Thank you. For more information about Pro Batter Sports, visit them on the web at probatter.com.